Lord, pour out your spirit upon us that your word would be spoken and your word alone received. In Christ's name, amen. I know this uh, probably seems all very familiar to you, but it is very foreign to me <laughs> to not be over there and not have a pulpit in front of me. And also, I want to honor the tradition. This service is, uh, I'm overdressed, and I apologize for that. I, I, uh, I'll get used to wearing street clothes, but I'm not quite there yet. Bear with me. Um, and you'll be relieved to know, I think, that I, I'm not going to touch uh, the end of Second Timothy, First uh, Timothy, chapter two. Uh, so you can just rest easy. I'm not going to go there. I'd be glad to speak with you about it one-on-one, uh, -on -one anytime. Um, it's not that I don't believe the Word of God, but there are some texts that are more challenging than others. And we have enough challenge today in the rest of the reading. So there you go. And uh, I want to begin with a question: If Jesus were here in the U.S. today, would he be a Republican or a Democrat? Um, actually, the 8 o'clock said <laughs> a Republican, um, but I'm not really asking for an answer. It's kind of a silly question. We all know what he, he'd be an independent, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I hope you know. I'm kidding. I don't think it's really helpful to speculate about such things. Uh, but just for fun, I did Google that to, to see what Google had to say. If you Google Jesus as a Republican, you get almost 26 million hits. If you Google Jesus as a Democrat, you get half of that, just about 12 and a half million hits. And if you Google Jesus as an independent, you get 40 million hits. Now, there's no point to all that except to say this, that there's no shortage of people out there claiming that Jesus is part of their party, <laughs> okay? Or, or at least arguing violently that he's not part of that other party. A little silly, I'm sure, but it hints at a more serious, a more serious issue. And that is the question of what should be our relationship. What should be the relationship between Christianity and politics or government? What should be the church's relationship to politics and government? And more importantly, perhaps, what should be our own relationship as individual Christians to politics and the government? And I'm talking to this because Paul speaks to that in the epistle. You may notice that's where it begins. That's where Paul begins. He says our role and relationship as Christians and the, with the government is to pray. Bit of a startling thing. Don't we think uh, organize and protest and send in letters to our congressmen? Paul says our primary tool is prayer urge you, he says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all kings. You can read all leaders, all rulers, all in authority, he says, pray. Pray to what end? Paul says, so the church, we, may lead a quiet, peaceable life, godly and respectful in every way, to what end? So we can fulfill our mission. So we can get on with the gospel, bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jesus is their Lord and Savior. It's a remarkable injunction to the Christians in his, his day. If you think about it, who was emperor? Anybody know? Nero. Nero was emperor, and Nero was persecuting Christians, torturing Christians. He was putting the Christians in the Colosseum for entertainment so they'd be chewed up by lions and, and slain by the gladiators. Nero's the one that set Christians on fire to light his garden parties. And Paul is urging prayer for Nero and for all in authority. For, with thanksgiving, he says, intercession, supplication, thanksgiving. Why? So they'll leave us alone, that we can do the work that God has given us to do, spread the good news of salvation. Not to organize, or pro and I'm not saying we don't organize, but He's saying, Paul is saying, we, we pray. He's not even urging them to resist torture, arrest, or imprisonment. Pray so the Lord will intervene so we can get on with his work. To explain to the world that there's one God and 
one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who died for the sins of us all. And he says, everywhere, lifting up holy hands, not with anger or quarreling. What an idea in our culture today. Though a lot more can be said about Christians and politics and government, but I would just like us to see this as an example of a broader principle. Okay, a broader principle that's found in our other readings today. It's found in all the readings. And the principle is simply that God calls us as his church to make good use of the resources that he's given us to achieve the purposes he's given us. That's shot through all of our readings. I'll explain that in a moment. But that's what Paul is doing here. The chief asset that the Lord has given us to deal with the worldly powers and authorities is prayer. Paul's saying, use that authority, use that power, use my resources, God's resources that he's given you for the purposes God's given for the church. Now, you know what our purpose is. I'm, I'm sure you do. It hasn't changed uh, since the Great Commission, uh, which is that we would go and make disciples of all nations. Now, there's, there's a lot of foundation under that. I mean, you realize that he's talking, that's a commission for Christians. That's for commission for people that know and love Jesus Christ. And so that's the first step is that we know and love Jesus Christ. And so we're part of the body of Christ. And then our commission as the body is to go out into the world and spread the good news. And Paul is saying, use the resources we have for that purpose. That's Amos's message to the people of Israel this morning as well. Our Old Testament reading, God is saying to them, I've given you a lot of resources, but you're not using them for my purposes. I, I've given you money, I've given you wealth, I've given you grain, I've given you commerce, and I've given you my law, my instructions for living, for holy living. And a key part of that, you can't read the Old Testament without finding it, it's shot through with the instruction to care for the poor, to take care of the needy, and why did God give them that instruction? What was the purpose behind that? That was so that the whole world could look at Israel and see how good it is, how wonderful it is to live under God's law and under his authority and rule. Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the nations, that they would look at how they treated one another, how they loved one another, how they cared for the poor, how there was no starvation, there was no slavery in, Egypt, in, in, in Israel. They lived under God's rule and he's given them the resources to do that and he says this to them, I've given you all of that and you're not using it for the purposes that I intended it. What you're doing with the resources I gave you, you're just trying to get richer. You're not taking care of the poor. He says, you're trampling them on your way to get more money. You're not ending slavery, you're making slaves. You're buying slaves. You're ignoring my word, my law, and my purposes. And so God says, it's rather harsh, isn't it? He says, but the consequences are coming. I'm going to turn your, your songs into laments. I'm going to turn your feasts into mourning. And there's going to be a famine in the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, as bad as that is. He says, there's going to be a famine of hearing my word. In other words, if you don't use my resources for the purposes I intended, you're not going to have them the resources and you're not going to have me. Same principle is in the gospel reading this morning. Wouldn't have been my first choice for a gospel passage today. It's a tough one, isn't it? This dishonest steward who essentially cheats his master and comes out on the looking good. He, he's... he's uh, He's been accused of fraud. He's going to lose his job. And so he goes to the debtors, his master's debtors, and he says, uh, uh, cut the amounts that you owe. Reduce your own debt. Just, you know, slice it down. Cut it down. And that way he's benefiting himself, right? Because they're going to look kindly on him later. He's going to get fired, but he's going to have some friends in the community because he saved him a bunch of money. And the numbers here are huge. Those, those numbers in the, in the story, that's a lot of money involved. The debt is being reduced. This is massive debt reduction. There's a benefit uh, to the master as well. He's going to have a little less money, but he's going to look like a hero 
in the community. As far as the community knows, he cut the debts, and it's a big infusion of, of uh, debt relief, if you will, for the community. And he looks good. He's a hero, so he praises the dishonest steward. Okay. Strange story, but then Jesus turns around and says it to the church. If they know how to do that out there, unrighteous people, ungodly people know how to use worldly wealth to the good advantage, how much more should we, he says, as the church, use the resources of the world that we're entrusted with? We, we have money. We make money. We, we have time. We have talents. How much more should we be using those and investing those on behalf of God's kingdom. The, the world can do it. The children of light should be doing it as well. And if we're faithful in that little thing, using our time and our talents and our treasures for the kingdom of God, then God will make us faithful over great things. What could be greater? Well, how about a deeper love for the Lord and for each other and for the lost? And how about the gifts and fruit of the Holy Spirit? How about that we're entrusted with all of that if we can manage to use our resources for God's kingdom. Jesus ends with a warning and a promise. Basically, you can't do both. We, we, we can't be engaged in the pursuit of money for money's sake and still love the Lord. We won't end up loving him. We'll end up hating him. And if we pursue the Lord, we will end up leaving the financial side to take care of itself. So, my question this to you is, where are we in this? How are we doing with this principle of the kingdom, you and I? Where is the church today, Trinity Church? And I'm new, right? And I'm the last one to be up here throwing stones. I don't know. Maybe we're probably doing wonderfully. I know there's a lot of outreach going on. I have learned that much about this place. But how are we doing? How are we doing? How are we doing as individuals? Are we, each one of us, using our God-given resources, time, talent, and treasure for the kingdom of God? Do we even, here's a better question maybe, do we even think about the ultimate goal of the church, the Great Commission, when we're deciding, you and I individually, how we're going to use our time and talent and treasure? Could we admit, I will admit it here in front of you all, I could do better. Uh, maybe you could too, in taking that as a priority in my use of my time and talent and treasure, the kingdom of God, the spread of the gospel. Now, um, I can see your faces, and I think I can read your minds. Um, I know what I, my reaction to this when I was working on this sermon. Uh, I don't really want to go there. <laughs> Surprise? Do we, aren't we comfortable? I'm comfortable. Becky and I, I think, are comfortable with how we're using our resources, our time and talent and treasure. We're pretty comfortable right now. I don't want to, I don't want to go there. I don't want to change. Do we want to change? Well, probably not. But then could we just back up one step and say, are we willing to pray? Are we willing as a body and individually to pray that the Lord would change our hearts, that by his Holy Spirit, he would give us a more of a heart for the lost, for the truly poor and needy in our world today, which I admit there are all kinds of needs, but the, the, what breaks his heart most are the people that live their lives and die not knowing him, not knowing the love that he has for them and how the, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has opened a door to eternal life. Do our hearts break with what breaks his heart? Could we pray for that if we're struggling with, well, I don't really want to change it. Could we pray that God would change us? Now, if you're, if you're like I am, you, you know the problem with that prayer, right? He does. He, he, he honors that prayer. He honors that prayer every time. He will begin the process of changing. And then, then we're stuck right where we didn't want to be, which is, all right, now, now, I'm, now I'm more committed. Now I, got, <laughs> now I got to give more and do more. And oh, so how about this? Step back, even another step back from that prayer. Lord, change my heart. Okay, that's too much. Then how about, Lord, 
would you make me willing to have a changed heart? Would you just tweak my wanter a little bit that I would want a changed heart? You see where I'm end, I, I am ending. Where I'm ending, I end, I'm ending where I started, which is prayer. The thing that we have, the, the, the resource we have for affecting government and life in the United States is prayer. And the only resource that you and I have for changing our hearts is prayer. I don't know about you, but how many times have you, <laughs> you resolved or something that you were going to do something different? We're gonna, I'm going to change. I'm, and how does that work? How many... How many New Year's Eve resolutions are broken in 10 days? I think it's 90%. At any rate, you know what I'm saying. God alone can change the human heart. The Lord alone can give us a heart for the lost. The Lord alone can break our hearts for what breaks his. So the greatest resource we have, the only resource we have, is prayer. And I raise this with you today. I, I didn't pick the lessons for that's the beauty of the lectionary you get what you get and this is these are some tough verses especially for a new kid on the block who's coming in and meeting many of you for the first time but I believe that this whole th idea of prayer for ourselves individually and for the church is a key part of our moving on moving past the loss, the recent loss of a rector and the sadness and disappointment that's gone along with that and some of the tension and the sense of dis-ease. It's a key thing, I think, for each of us in our church for that our attention and our prayers and our hearts be more keenly focused on using our resources for the work of the kingdom as God intended to bring the loss to faith. Now, I want you to uh, promise me that you're not going to go out today from this service and say, uh, I was told I should, okay? If you do that, then my wife is going to leave me, okay? I, I am not shoulding on you. This is not a should sermon. This is not a call to do something, to make a plan, to set a new vision, to form a committee or a commission. It's not a call to do more or try harder or sacrifice more. It's simply a call for prayer. I'm calling myself and I'm calling each of us in our congregation, all of us to pray for a changed heart, a renewed heart, filled with God's love, a heart filled with his love for the loss, a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, or at least if you can't do that, for a prayer to desire that. And if we can't even do that, a prayer to be willing to desire it. You know how the Lord works with this, right? If he, he will take the least, the tiniest little prayer, the, the least little shred of willingness in our hearts, he'll take that and turn it into a massive thing. A, a, a massive thing, which is a transformed human heart. A heart utterly committed to him. And to perish on fire with the gospel. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you that your word is so clear in what you expect. And your love is so great and your mercy and your grace that when we fall short, we don't get what we deserve. We get what we need. And so I pray, Lord, that you will place on our hearts a, more of a desire for your work to be done in our midst. We ask in Christ's name, amen.